of this series with a cliché on the word the West and its derivative such as Western Westernized, which suggests that the West is the solution for everything. It is interesting that sometimes, to designate the same Western countries, we speak of the Northern countries, like in the expression North-South Cooperation. Whatever they are called, the West and the North, designate the same group of countries that commonly possess the right culture and superior civilization, the right standards that needed to be spread across the whole world through colonization. It is now well known that most African kingdoms massively resisted the invaders. Invaders often won the wars, but when African and Afro-descendant people successfully fought this injection of civilization, it has directly transformed forever the configuration and geography of the current world. So, in this second part of the quest on the impact that Africans have had on the so-called Western world today, let's take a direct flight to a small and poor country which is not in Africa but was then occupied by African slaves. Hello and welcome to the heart of the history on the depth of the West, especially the United States, to this country, admittedly small in size but very big in history. African History Daily by my daddy. What words do you think are the most synonymous with Haiti? Is it Fujis, the Tonton Makout, the former priest and then president Jean-Bertrand Aristide, the musician and then president Michel Martelly? Is it Papa Doc Duvalier, skyrocketing poverty levels? Or is it the architect of the current world? You can of course make several choices, but you will agree that the least obvious choice, the one which is not in many history books, is indeed the last one, architect of the current world, which reveals the crucial role of this country, formerly called Saint-Domingue, before being renamed Haiti, land of high mountains, after its independence. To understand why, we must go back in time to the 18th century, when Saint-Domingue was a large French slave colony. The island was thriving, producing then 60% of the world's coffee, as well as 40% of the sugar imported by France and Britain. This was until it was struck by the French Revolution in 1789, which culminated on February 4, 1794, to the abolition of slavery in the French colonial empire. But out of necessity, the former planters, like dogs from which their bones are taken, were crying out loud to the restoration of slavery in colonies. These nostalgic fans of the old regime managed to convince the French emperor, Napoleon Bonaparte, very well known for his megalomaniac dreams, to relaunch the war with the main objective of restoring French authority and slavery in the French America. Concretely, Napoleon wanted to extend the French Empire, which would then go from the island of the Caribbean seas to Canada, including Louisiana, a huge territory of more than 1,200,000 square kilometers, with land from 15 present US states and two Canadian provinces today. It must be said that until 1776, the United States was just 13 colonies whose total area was less than that of Louisiana alone. France had lost part of the Louisiana territory west of the Mississippi after the Seven Years' War, but that territory was given back by Spain in 1800 via the secret treaty of San Ildefonso. Napoleon's dream was to producing wood and flour in Louisiana to feed Haiti once slavery is restored there. The two colonies, Louisiana and Haiti, would therefore have to operate in tandem to form the new economic backbone of the French Empire. And to reach this objective, Napoleon sent a strong expedition of 30,000 men led by his own brother-in-law, General Leclerc, who left France early 1802 heading to the then free colony of Haiti in order to restore order and slavery. However, Napoleon's dream was crushed against a wall, a wall made of valiant black soldiers led by Jean-Jacques de Salines. Two-thirds of the French army is massacred in a year. It was then the first African military victory in history over a European army and Haiti declared well-deserved independence on January 1st, 1804. So while Napoleon's army was suffering his most humiliating defeat, 
And while Toussaint Louverture, the first liberator of Haiti, was dying in prison during his exile in France, Thomas Jefferson, the American president, sent a delegation to Paris for land negotiation with Napoleon. The objective of this mission? Negotiate with France to buy New Orleans and Florida. And if it doesn't work, then at least obtain a right of discharge in the New Orleans for the goods produced in the West of America. They had a rather comfortable shopping budget of 10 million US dollars. I can imagine that cliché with the Americans walking in the cowboy shoes and hats clashing with the splendid lounges of the French castle of Versailles. I can imagine them saying, Oh my goodness! As Napoleon Bonaparte and his ministers spontaneously offered to sell Louisiana territory to them, which was no longer of any interest to France. The fate of Louisiana territory was settled for the tidy sum of 60 million francs or 15 million US dollars, which was 1.5 times the gross domestic product of America in that year. Napoleon was known to always repeat Daring, daring, always daring. And I guess Jefferson became his idol for making such a huge and crazy expense. On May the 2nd, 1803, when the selling agreement was signed in Paris, the United States of America saw its size double thanks to its small neighbor filled with former African slaves. What was at stake in Haiti was not only the freedom of Haiti, but also the current size of the United States and its access to the sea. It was the weakening of the British crown. It was the future birth of Liberia, the future of other slaves' revolt. In short, it was the architecture of the current world. What does history today remember of these Haitian heroes? My African cliché of the day is a symbolic reparation of the amount of $1 that each American citizen and each French citizen could pay into a fund for Haiti. Some will respond promptly that the West is already providing development assistance. But is this aid really benefiting the children of Haitian heroes? True reparation is what the Australian Aborigines have just obtained from the court for the destruction of the culture by the British colonies. The British colonies, also ancestors of the great novelist Charles Dickens, who once wrote, I quote, Imagine a long chain of gold, thorns and flowers which would never have linked you if, on a certain and memorable day, the first ring had not formed. Well, if this memorable day was that of a victory of Haiti over France, then this long chain also includes all Africans in history who resisted colonization and neocolonialism. All Africans doing great work today to support communities, such as Odiri Ingamre and her NGO Daughters of Africa, and such as Rita Edmond with her community empowerment support organization. This chain finally includes everyone who refused to contribute to the looting of the dreams of African children all over the world. What about you? Are you included in these chains of fighters? I let you think about it until we board the last trip of this trilogy. Thank you and goodbye.